So I'm going to talk about the, the life cycle assessment work that uh, we started in 2008 um, uh, with a definition of uh, sustainability that came from uh, the supply chain in a room meeting in May or June of 2008 in Arkansas. Uh, everybody uh, had lots of conversations and among the things that came out of this uh, conversation in Arkansas was uh, this definition. So uh, to provide consumers with nutritious dairy products that support the industry, support the environment, and uh, improve the sociology, rural sociology in particular, in particular, but uh, as the Brundtland Commission uh, pointed out, that we uh, enable not only economic and viable production today but for future generations and so resource conservation is really important. So uh, in that context, uh, thinking about stewardship, uh, again uh, pointing to, to Jude uh, Capper's paper that was mentioned uh, by David in just the previous slide and, and other, other, others today, um, we see that the total milk production over the past 50 years has uh, been increasing uh, the total number of dairy animals has been decreasing and the animal uh, per animal production has increased uh, up to about 9,500 or so kilograms of milk per year. What does this improved efficiency mean in terms of uh, sustainability and stewardship? Well, less feed is required, less land area, therefore less pressure on biodiversity, etc less water, fewer greenhouse gases. All of this has come about through uh, this list of technological uh, improvements, mechanization, uh, better genetics, better rations, uh, preventative health and, and uh, uh, cow uh, animal welfare. All of these things uh, have led to this uh, continuous improvement in the dairy industry, which, which we hope to be able to continue. So why conduct a life cycle assessment? And, and I'm uh, going to operate on the assumption that most of you know what an LCA is, but uh, very briefly, we track uh, resource inputs and energy uh, material flows from uh, the extraction of coal necessary for electricity uh, all the way through production of, of everything necessary to get milk to the consumer, including the disposal of packaging uh, or milk lost, wasted during the uh, uh, anywhere else along the supply chain, accounting for all of that. Uh, why is that important? Um, frankly, many of the things that we understand from LCA are, are relatively common sense, but uh, we can measure it, we can quantify it, and we know that if we don't measure it, we're unlikely to manage it, or at least not to manage it as well as we could. Uh, another thing, uh, oops, given the, uh, the uh, interest in the consumer, uh, it provides a baseline against which future improvements can be benchmarked. Uh, how much has our uh, carbon emissions and or other uh, environmental impacts, how much have we improved over time? So we can benchmark that with a life cycle assessment. Uh, and importantly, with regard to the, the topic today, mitigation and adaptation, we can identify opportunities for improvement uh, in the supply chain. So it was a, a large study. It took us about two years uh, to, go, to work through it all. Uh, and in the end, we can calculate, benchmark, and communicate the environmental performance of the dairy sector. Uh, we did that by... Uh, sending out about 5,000 surveys. Uh, we got about a 10% uh, rate of return, which some people think is low, but we were thrilled to get that many because it was a, well, really hard survey, as Rick, uh, who, who was involved in that process, can attest to. 43 uh, very difficult questions that required them to go back in their records and, and pull out information, so it's, it, it was not qualitative. Uh, it took them many hours to do it. Uh, we worked with some uh, several co-ops, and we have uh, a database of over 200,000 uh, uh, round trips for uh, milk transport from the farm to the milk processor, 50 uh, plants 
uh, milk processing plants responded with detailed uh, information and all of this was supplemented with uh, peer-reviewed literature, expert interviews, uh, information from uh, publicly available databases. It was a, a grass to glass or cradle to grave analysis all the way from crop production through distribution, retail, and including uh, consumption and end of life uh, assessment. <clears throat> so uh, looking at the, the fluid milk section of the dairy, uh, fluid milk products, fluid milk meaning that which is consumed as a beverage, uh, the carbon footprint. Here's the big picture. Um, not surprisingly, uh, about 72% of the total carbon footprint uh, is accounted by the time the milk leaves the, the dairy farm gate. Uh, the units here are uh, teragrams of CO2, which is equivalent to million metric tons, which we've seen. Uh, in life cycle assessment, we do an accounting uh, so that the product of interest carries the burden and any additional products which are uh, generated in the, in the supply chain carry away some of the burden. And so we see on the top of the Sankey chart here uh, at the farm gate, uh, about four teragrams are uh, allocated to beef that then the, the beef sector absorbs that. Uh, there is also excess cream. We, we don't, uh, uh, as consumers, use all of the cream that's produced in uh, beverage milk. And so uh, that uh, w was actually surprising to us that there's a, a larger uh, amount of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide equivalents that leaves the fluid milk system associated with cream than with beef. And then you can see along the bottom some, some additional uh, inputs to the system, transport to the processor, the processing itself, packaging, retail, and consumption. The net result is about 35 million metric tons for fluid milk, which translates to between 15 and 20 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent per gallon of milk consumed. So that's the big picture. Uh, a bit uh, of a Another view on the, the big picture uh, comes from here. We see across the uh, x-axis the stages in the supply chain and the bars uh, in terms of teragrams of uh, CO2 emissions, CO2 equivalent emissions. Uh, we see these different colors and in the field uh, about half and half between uh, really nitrous oxide and uh, fuel combustion on the farm as we've already seen about 50-50 between enteric methane uh, and manure management. The uh, processing, retail, and consumer are dominated by electricity consumption, packaging uh, by chemicals, and transport, not surprisingly, by fuel, uh, fuel consumption. So by understanding from a life cycle perspective what is contributing to the footprint, we can begin uh, making more intelligent choices about how to apply mitigation strategies. By, by knowing this uh, uh, quantitatively, we can better assess how we can improve. Another major uh, understanding from the survey data uh, is shown in this slide. So it's a, the box whisker chart. So half of the farms are in the box, and then the, the whiskers go out to um, uh, down to 10 and up to 90 percent, and so the, the dots then are the uh, worst 10 percent of performers here and the best 10 percent of performers down there. So about, about 50 farms represented here and 50 farms represented here. And what we see is a tremendous variation in uh, farm gate carbon footprint. Why is that important? It tells us that without even uh, developing any new technology, right? because all of the technology that exists is, is already being employed by somebody. So something is making uh, a big difference here between the, the manure print that's, that's very small and, and that that's very large, or the overall farm print that ranges from about 0.75 up to uh, nearly three kilograms of CO2e per uh, kilogram of milk produced. Understanding that means that by technology transfer, really, uh, from the, the, the poor perform from the better performers to the poor performers, we can improve the whole 
uh, sector's performance. Doesn't really uh, help us on individual farms and where to look on individual farms, but uh, thinking about uh, sector level improvement. And to be honest, the atmosphere doesn't care about individual farms. It cares about the total CO2 uh, emitted by all of us. But at the sector level, it's quite important to, to, to think about that. We looked at uh, region and size effects as well. And you can see that there are some regional and size effects, although the, the error, uh, error bar shown by the, 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 the black bar here suggests that for the most part there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of overlap and that we may not really have statistically significant differences. Uh, the number of uh, farms here was very low, uh, probably less than 10, and so we don't have a lot of confidence uh, in, in these data. One thing that I do want to point out, though, that that's, I find really interesting about this is here in, in Region 4, we see that uh, there's relatively small variation associated with farm size uh, at, the, at the top level, at the, the total farm emission level. What we do see is that the enteric methane contribution in the small farms is notably larger than that in the large, uh, large herd uh, farms. Uh, and that the reverse happens in terms of manure management. So what's going on there? <clears throat> what we think is that uh, it seems in a, in a somewhat general way, and I do not know that I can completely explain it, uh, that the larger farms tend to have better feed conversion ratios, right? So there's less energy lost as enteric methane. Larger farms also at least in Region 4, tend to have anaerobic lagoons, which have a, a much higher uh, emission of methane. The, this difference in feed conversion may be somewhat connected, although we weren't able to verify this, with the, the forage to concentrate uh, ratio. So these, these big farms in uh, New Mexico and Arizona, and Arizona are, are feeding a lot of concentrates, and so we know that the feed conversion will be a, a, a bit more effective there. But then there's this trade-off, and so understanding uh, at, at this level of granularity what's going on on the farms helps us identify uh, mitigation technologies that, that may be useful. And uh, in the last presentation, there was a, a, a good list of options uh, for these things, at least to be considered. So we know that manure management is important. We also know that uh, mitigating enteric methane emissions is um, challenging. There's a lot of uh, active research in that area. Um, so we asked the question, uh, what happens if we look at the 50 best performing farms, we, we look at the uh, profile of the various manure management technologies that are employed on those 50 farms, and we apply that distribution of manure management to the whole uh, system. Um, what would be the potential reduction in greenhouse gases? And it's, uh, it's pretty significant, about 14% reduction. You see that this went from uh, about 8 down to about 3.3, and so uh, what's, what's the difference? Well, the, the, it's not that we completely eliminated any of the manure management options, but there are more anaerobic digesters uh, as, a, as a percentage, right? And so the, the Dairy Management Innovation Center is pushing uh, the industry to adopt more uh, anaerobic digesters. And we uh, saw from Bill's talk this morning, the USDA also wants to increase the number uh, from, well, 200 to roughly 700, right? So, so this has some significant potential as a, as a mitigation option. Uh, beyond the farm gate is also important. <clears throat> the first step, of course, is the, the raw milk transport. So uh, the red dot here is a processing facility, and the blue dots represent farms that are within, um, I'm not sure what the radius is right now, but the average uh, trip uh, for this particular uh, data set was 288 miles per trip, the longest 983. <clears throat> and uh, what's interesting is uh, that if we zoom in here, we see that there are uh, 
a cluster of farms here, and they're not all going to the same processor. Uh, and so what's, what's going on there? Right? We don't really know, and obviously it's complicated, and it's got to do with contracts and uh, you know, the economics of uh, how somebody negotiates this or that, but it suggests, at least, that there may be some optimization in, in the transport uh, stage uh, that can help uh, reduce the carbon footprint and, and energy footprint fuel usage associated with the, the dairy supply chain. Going then to the processing facility itself, and this is the result of the 50 um, plants that we surveyed. The, the largest single contributor is uh, from the truck tailpipe. Uh, so fuel, diesel primarily, combustion, electricity at the plant, uh, the container itself, uh, plant fuel, and this is uh, probably natural gas, uh, container formation, and a little bit of refrigerant. So uh, about 6.8% of the, the processing total is associated with uh, leakage from uh, refrigerated trucks that are delivering uh, from the processing facility. Uh, to either distribution centers or, or retail outlets. Um, and, and while the, uh, we, we saw that the overall uh, footprint uh, per kilogram of milk was about um, two kilograms per kilogram, so this entire uh, section of the supply chain really only contributes about 10%. Does that mean that we shouldn't worry about it? No. Uh, I... I, I like to say that we're all in this sustainability game together and that if everybody on the planet who makes what a hundred decisions a day about uh, mining things if everybody made an extra decision that was using less energy turn the dadgum lights out when you leave the room right turn the water off when you brush your teeth if all 7.5 billion of us did that every day it would add up to a lot so we can't ignore these things just because they're small they may not move the needle very far but in aggregate they are important looking at uh, retail and consumption we see that the two drivers are refrigerants and electricity we see that the convenience stores which sell uh, often small uh, packages uh, and don't have uh, as efficient a refrigeration uh, system because they're typically uh, smaller than in the, the large supermarkets uh, or mass merchandisers. So uh, these also represent some opportunities uh, for improvement in the supply chain. This is also a very important takeaway uh, from the work that we did. <clears throat> Across the bottom of the chart, we see the, the different supply chains. So uh, raw milk production and transport. So this is getting it uh, you know, field all the way to the processor gate. Uh, the blue bar in each of these columns represents the uh, greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with activity which occur at that supply chain stage. So this blue bar represents 10% of the total that I showed you in that previous slide. The green in each of these represents the uh, emissions which actually occur on the farm or before the farm but are associated with milk that is lost or wasted in the supply chain. So there's a, a one or two percent loss at processing, there's a roughly three percent loss in distribution centers and retail and consumers waste about 20% of the milk that they purchase, either because little Johnny didn't want to finish his milk because the Cheerios are all gone, uh, or it went, uh, it went bad in the refrigerator. And so you can see that the consumer is, uh, you know, half of uh, the, the impact that we might attribute to behavior of the consumer is actually uh, emissions which occur on the farm, way up the supply chain. And of course, the consumer causes induced loss uh, because they buy about one and a half. Uh, I think we have to produce 1.45 uh, uh, kilograms of milk for every kilogram of milk that's consumed out here. So there's a, a, a big uh, opportunity uh, to minimize the overall industry's emissions profile by looking at that. It's not a good idea, as we heard this morning, to look at a single metric in making uh, sustainability decisions. So I want to touch on uh, water footprint. Uh, 
Uh, some quick terminology here. Water withdrawal is what it sounds like. Uh, blue water consumed is the, the loss of available surface or uh, groundwater from a catchment, a, water, a watershed that may leave with the product. It might be evapotranspired uh, or it might be hauled in a truck because of uh, fracking. Who knows? Um, <clears throat> water stress index is a measure of the, the fraction of water consumed in a watershed which deprives somebody else from using it. So if we withdraw water from a river or lake and we irrigate our uh, uh, corn or other crop, uh, that water is not available for somebody else to use and so it's considered uh, water in competition. Another term that we hear is green water. Uh, generally it refers to rainwater. Uh, typically stored in the soil as soil moisture and ultimately lost by evapotranspiration. Uh, some water footprinting uh, uh, methodologies account for uh, green water and others do not. Uh, in the work that I'll show uh, in the next slide, it's not included. Gray water, you should just forget about and just say, let's let the uh, uh, pollution be accounted for as pollution and let's not uh, talk about dilution being a solution. This is the uh, water footprint networks uh, approach to handling degraded water quality. <clears throat> not surprisingly, uh, I hope, uh, almost all of the water footprint, the, the leaders of water in competition, about 140 uh, is associated with irrigation of crops. So if we're going to, to manage that, if we're going to look for uh, improved sustainability in the dairy sector with regard to water, uh, it's not that we don't focus on this at all, but we're not going to move the needle very far by uh, focusing on the, the, the water used for uh, milk production, processing, or, or downstream. Uh, adding a couple of other uh, uh, impact. So uh, phosphorus, uh, it leads to eutrophication of uh, freshwater. Nitrogen typically leads to eutrophication impacts in uh, marine waters. Uh, and then we have the, the water stress. Big surprise, water stress in the southwest and west. Not much water stress in the upper midwest, southeast uh, or northeast. But we see much lower uh, eutrophication impacts in the west and much more uh, uh, significant eutrophication impacts associated with uh, nutrient management in the Northeast. There's no one place to produce milk, right? We have to consider trade-offs between uh, carbon emissions, water-based impacts, and impacts to other environmental metrics as we think about sustainability. And I think this was uh, uh, well talked about this morning with regard to considering nutrient management and manure management, of course, uh, is really important in the context of uh, uh, these, these environmental impacts. So looking at mitigation, uh, what do we do? Well, we, we can manage what we measure. Uh, we know that uh, manure management is key for uh, many of the environmental impact categories that we care about. Uh, nitrogen uh, loss leading to marine eutrophication, climate change. We know that um, uh, feed production and nutrient management uh, really have effects that are, that are local uh, as opposed to uh, greenhouse gas emissions which essentially get into the atmosphere and they're distributed uh, globally pretty, pretty rapidly. Uh, we know from our work that uh, uh, beneficial management practices are effective. We saw that operations with the smaller carbon footprint tended to have better feed conversion. Uh, and so, so better management, less loss of feed, uh, perhaps uh, uh, better supplementation with uh, concentrates. Uh, that said, there is no one size one solution fits all. And given, given the, 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 the balancing act that we have between the different um, impact categories, uh, we have to be uh, thinking about how uh, our understanding of trade-offs, which we can identify through life cycle assessment, uh, can help uh, uh, target our improvement opportunities at various locations. 
uh, product loss is important. Um, I'll let you look at this in the, uh, in the handout uh, or in the, in the proceedings of the, the conference uh, to get through a little bit uh, quicker. Um, but there's a, a number of things that we can recommend that uh, would be uh, good for mitigation. The Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy has a number of projects which I expect many of you are familiar with, and so I won't spend much time on that, but the, the Cow of the Future, Dairy Power, the, the Digester Program, uh, Fleet Smart, Plant Smart, uh, Next Generation Clean in Place uh, studies ongoing. So <clears throat> to be frank, life cycle assessment is probably not the best tool for uh, assessing adaptation options. Uh, Al's talk this morning using the, the process model for dairy uh, is probably a better uh, way to look at that. But uh, I was asked to, to sort of touch on it, so I will. Uh, a couple of things that I think are important. Um, why do I have this up here? The El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, explains 35% of variability in wheat production globally. Well, we already know how shifts in weather patterns affect wheat, for example. And so what have we done? We can learn from that. We can manage the risk to production by understanding a little bit better how, how things have been done already, right? We're already and always adapting to changing conditions. And so uh, as, as um, Al and uh, Art uh, showed this morning, the, the changes, they're coming. We know which direction they're going. We don't know how far they're going to go. Uh, they're highly uncertain, particularly as we try to look at very fine spatial scales. And so uh, considering the adaptation as ongoing risk management, right? So looking at what we've done, I know that uh, I think it was Bill who talked about the, the rate of change is, is increasing and that the slow sort of uh, adaptation may not be sufficient in the future. Um, but it will be sufficient for uh, the next several years. Um, and you guys don't need to see this. You know it's going to get warmer. Uh, so what do we do? This one I think is interesting. I don't think anybody has shown this. The, the degree heating days uh, will be uh, noticeably higher over the next 20 years as compared to the, uh, the, the early 2000s. And so what does that mean? We've already had some people talk about double cropping and earlier planting uh, different cultivars and whatnot. I'm going to skip that slide because it's too busy. Uh, this was an interesting one uh, looking at uh, the FAO Climate Smart Livestock Program. Again, I'll let you look at the details, but some uh, assessments of different adaptation technologies and how effective they may be as an adaptation or a mitigation strategy, uh, some constraints to adoption, and that's it. Any questions?